Good morning, and welcome to our video devotion for Thursday, March the 18th, 2021. It is a privilege for me to be able to share these times with you. I hope that you enjoy them as much as I enjoy bringing them to you. Now this morning, we're going to look at one of Jesus' I Am statements found in the book of John. So if you have your Bibles with me, turn to the 6th chapter of John, and we'll begin at the 27th verse. John chapter 6, verses 27 through 35. Listen to what God's Word says here. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that will endure to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on Him God the Father has placed His seal of approval. Then they ask Him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one He has sent. So they ask Him, What sign will you, will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. All right. I want you to notice what just happened here. Jesus has been talking about hunger, food, bread, and eternal life. But in the 35th verse, he adds something kind of new to these promises that he's making. Anybody notice what it is? That's right. He promises to quench thirst. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. You know, this was not the first time that we've heard Jesus make this promise in the Gospel of John. Remember the woman at the well? Listen to what Jesus tells her in John chapter 4, verses 13, verses 13 and 14. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. All right, think about this with me. Who wrote the Gospel of John? And by the way, don't, don't, don't overthink this. It was John, one of Jesus' twelve disciples. John was an eyewitness to everything that happened. It's one of the things that makes his gospel different from, say, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who had to depend. These guys were not members of Jesus' band of disciples. They depended on other people for their information about Jesus, but John recorded what he had experienced firsthand, which is why he was always sharing little details that only a firsthand witness would have noticed. So when Jesus tells the crowd, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never be, go hungry, and he who believes in me will never, go, never be thirsty. John's mind would have flashed back to Jesus' earlier conversation with the woman at the well. Whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John would have made the connection between these two statements. Just like water and bread are essential to sustaining physical life, when it comes to spiritual matters, only Jesus, who is the living water and the bread of life, can provide and sustain eternal life. All right. With all that in mind, let's look at what Jesus goes on to say in the 46th verse. Notice what he says here. All right, sometimes my pages stick together. Has that ever happened to you when you're reading your Bible? All right. Verse 46. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Now, if you were in the crowd that day listening to Jesus preach, this is one of the most difficult things you've ever heard him say. 
All that stuff about being the bread of life, you know, maybe you've decided that's something of a spiritual metaphor. But this statement makes absolutely no sense. It's ridiculous. It's actually blasphemous because it's contrary to everything you've ever been taught about God. For instance, let's say that I tell you that I saw Pam earlier today. What what would that mean? It means that earlier today, my wife and I had a face-to-face encounter. We met. She looked into my eyes. I looked into her, uh, her eyes, and I gave her a big kiss. Now, the reason that meeting was possible is because we live in physical bodies. There is something to see here. But the Bible tells us that God the Father is pure spirit. He doesn't have a body. You can't look into his face. You can't, he doesn't have a face. Now, do you know why a Jew would have thought that it was sort of bizarre to hear Jesus said, say, I have seen God? It was more than bizarre. It was a blasphemy. At least, if Jesus wasn't telling the truth, it was a blasphemy. Because he's acting as if God is something that he's not. So what did Jesus mean when he said, no one has seen the Father except the one who is from God? Only he has seen the Father. Well, what it means is that Jesus had a relationship with God that is deeper and more intimate than anyone or anything else in all creation. Jesus is God's one and only Son. In the New Testament translation, Jesus is referred to as God's only begotten Son. It's newer translations that, 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 that use the, the expression that I just used, God's one and only Son. You know, this is sort of a poor illustration, but I hope, I hope it will help you understand what we're talking about here today. I have some friends who have three daughters. After trying to have children for a long time, they adopted their first daughter when she was like 24 hours old. And then, as so often happens, the new mother got pregnant and had the first of two biological daughters. Now, here's the thing. These parents love all of their children equally. All of their children are heirs to whatever they accumulate in their life. But only their second and third daughters are biological offspring. Their oldest daughter will always be their adopted child. Well, Essentially, that's the difference between our relationship with God and Jesus' relationship with God. Through faith in Christ and God's grace, you and I are sons and daughters of God. We're heirs to all of the Father's promises. We have the privilege of calling Him Abba Father, Daddy God. But the Bible always makes it clear that you and I are adopted children. Jesus, only, on the other hand, is the only begotten of the Father. In a sense, you can think of Him as God's biological child. He's fully God. He's uniquely the Son of God. No one or nothing else in all of creation has this kind of relationship that He has with God the Father. So in John chapter 14, 6, verse 46, when Jesus says, I've seen God, He's talking about His unique relationship with, with His heavenly Father. And that relationship means something to you and me, too. And that brings us to the oddest thing that Jesus says in the sixth chapter of John. Uh, Notice what he says here in verse uh, 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to him, them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in me. You know, it, one of the interesting things, if you look back in history, is to discover that the early Christians were often accused of cannibalism. If you wonder where that came from, well, there you go. I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. I mean, 
if you take those words literally, what have you got? You've got a religion that practices human sacrifice and then has a feast where you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the one who was sacrificed. It's kind of gruesome when you think about it. Of course, that's not what Jesus was talking about here. What he's doing is using vivid poetic language to express an ultimate spiritual, spiritual truth. And here's the truth. It's not enough to have head knowledge about Jesus. Head knowledge means you know where Jesus was born and how Jesus died, and, and you know a fact that says he died, he rose from the dead. Head knowledge means you're familiar with some of the miracles that Jesus performed, some of the things that he said, some of the places he visited. Head knowledge may even mean you know some of the theological truths about Jesus. But, but here's the thing, head knowledge isn't going to save you. This is what Jesus was talking about when he said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. You have to become one with Jesus. You have to give him your heart and your spirit and your mind, your life, everything there is about you. Jesus' agenda has to become your agenda. That's what it means to make Jesus Christ your Lord. Now, the relationship that you create with Jesus also has to be the most important relationship that you've got. No other relationship can take priority over the relationship that you have with Him because your relationship with Jesus is your relationship with God. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity we have to, to share this devotion time together, to, to take a deep dive into your word and, and to understand what Jesus was trying to tell us. Father, we thank you that we have life in him we thank you that Jesus purchased our life on the cross. Father, we love him. We love you. And we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for watching today's devotion. Uh, I was just thinking uh, a few minutes ago that uh, I want to tell you something about our, East, our Easter here at Sunset Road. Uh, it's, you know, Saturday, Sunday will be the 21st of March, just one week before Palm Sunday. On March the 28th, we will be celebrating Palm Sunday worship. Then on Friday, April the 2nd, we're going to be celebrating Good Friday worship at 12 noon. Now, if you can't make it here to the church for, for the Good Friday worship, we're going to be live streaming that service beginning at 11.55. And then on Easter Sunday morning, we're going to begin worship bright and early at 6.30 in the morning. Well, actually, it won't even be bright at that time. It'll still be dark, but we're going to be worshiping together, and I hope that you'll be able to join us at 6.30. Please bring your own long chairs to be, to, so that you can, you can sit. Please wear your masks and maintain social distance during that worship service. And, oh, by the way, if you can't make, what, make, make it to that service, we're going to try to live stream that one as well. So I hope that you'll join us beginning at 6.25. And finally, we'll be having Easter Sunday morning worship at 10.30. And once again, you can join us uh, at 10.20 for our live stream of the worship. Well, I also hope that you'll remember that you can join me again on Saturday for another video devotion. And Sunday's coming. So I hope that you'll be able to join us for Sunday morning worship this week. I hope that you have a happy and peaceful day. Always remember, I love you. Bye-bye.